Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week, I am joined by Chef Michael Knoll, who's the executive chef and owner of Bardo in Charlotte, North Carolina, along with another restaurant that he has called Vana. So he has two restaurant concepts, both in Charlotte. They're actually getting ready to open another location, um, which he does talk about a bit on the podcast here. I first kind of learned about Michael and Bardo just doing some research um, on the Charlotte area. You know, I had been there before and we had to go, unfortunately, down to Charlotte for a funeral. And this was back kind of in February and there was a big snowstorm that was coming, that was rolling in, big ice storm. If we were going to fly out, we would have pretty much gotten stuck at the airport no way we would have gotten out. So we wound up leaving a day early, got an Airbnb down in Charlotte. So and just drove down uh, ahead of the storm so we could make it there and then drove back after, you know, the storm was over. So we were down there for a couple of days and got an Airbnb. And, you know, we had some free time since we were there a little bit early before kind of all the funeral proceedings. So we wound up making a couple of reservations and uh, Bardo was one of them and had a fantastic time. It's a really interesting concept. They do a tasty menu, which isn't anything new, but what they also do is during the week, they'll make it an a la carte menu. So it's still all the different parts of the tasting menu, but you can kind of pick and choose what parts that you want. If there's something on the tasting menu that you don't like, um, you can kind of skip that dish. We elected to just do the tasting menu. Um, I think they offer two different course options. We went with the big one, the 12 course, like give me everything. Uh, I want to try it all. So had an amazing dinner. Um, it's an open kitchen. You can see right into the kitchen. You can see him doing everything. There was, uh, I think, Kenny Do who is uh, kind of the CDC, the sous chef uh, CDC there, and a couple of the other guys there um, too as well. So there's like three guys in the kitchen or something like that. And kind of the same deal with Vana too. And and Michael talks about this, but we talk about his career, you know, how he got started in the industry. You know, he worked at Chicago for a long time, kind of bouncing around the Chicago food scene, originally from Pittsburgh, you know, kind of why Pittsburgh has kind of been this challenged food market, um, doesn't have some big name restaurants or nationally recognized restaurants, you know, as other cities would and, and kind of why that is and the Charlotte food scene in general and kind of where it's been, where it's headed. And it seems like it's kind of on the up and up and on the rise and stuff too as well. So it was just a great experience and I was super happy to be able to get Michael on the podcast and just chat with him uh, about his career and Bardo and everything and stuff that they got coming up. So you can follow him on Instagram at Chef Michael Knoll. That is N-O-L-L for the last name there. All kind of one uh, word there. No gaps or underscores or anything. Also follow the restaurants at Bardo Restaurant and at Vana Restaurant too as well. You can follow us on Instagram at Spoon Mob. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. Uh, Spoon Mob 1 on Twitter and Facebook and then just at Spoon Mob on TikTok. But all those other platforms we pretty much do podcast announcements on. Um, Instagram's the one where we, you know, have different food photos and articles that we read and stuff like that too as well. So that's the one that we're most engaged on. Uh, check out the website, spoonmob.com. We have all information about every guest that's been on the podcast, uh, different food photos from the restaurants that we visited, their contact information, where they're located, updates um, from the previous time that they've been on the podcast until they return. Um, so we can talk about those updates with them. So all that stuff is there up on the website. There's a contact page too as well. You can send in questions, comments, feedback. If there's anything you ever wanted to ask a chef or a sommelier or something like that you're curious about, send it in. Um, we'll figure out kind of which guest it best lines up with after we do our research. And then uh, we'll incorporate it into the episode and hit you up and let you know, hey, you know, your question is going to be on this week's episode or, you know, next month's episode on the 7th or whatever. So you can kind of listen and see what the response is too, just in case you forgot about it. But any other questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to write those in. You can also email us directly, spoonmob at yahoo.com. And uh, make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. We're on all the platforms. You know, the big ones are obviously Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and then Google too as well, Google Podcasts. We're on all the other ones too, all the mid-tier ones. If you're an Android user, a lot of people have different players that they prefer based on the user interface and everything. So we're on all those. You can find us in everything. We also have a YouTube channel that we put the episodes out on a week after they come out on the podcast apps. So you can subscribe to the YouTube channel there. You can listen to the podcast through your TV or your phone if you're a YouTube um, premium subscriber. If you prefer that platform, um, we're on there too as well for you. So that is kind of it on the updates. So I will let you guys get into the episode. Here is my conversation with Chef Michael Knoll, the owner and executive chef of Bardo in Charlotte, North Carolina. Cool. Well, thanks again, you know, for agreeing to come on the podcast and, and taking some time out of your busy schedule. You got the two restaurants there and, and, and other stuff probably in the works too. 
we got to experience Bardo firsthand, the tasting menu, which uh, I think you guys were doing. Maybe you still are doing, but at the time it was like you could either do the a la carte menu on, I think, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, or you could do the tasting menu. We just wound up going all in on the tasting menu. Did the 12 courses, had an awesome time, open kitchen, can see you know everything in there, everything going on, cool vibe, music, all that stuff. So you know, before we kind of get into to Bardo and how it came to be, I always like to start at the beginning with everybody. How did you kind of first get into cooking and we'll go through your career, but you're originally, like you said, from Pittsburgh, not exactly like a, a giant food scene. Not at all. Now more so when I was there in late nineties, early two thousands. Yeah, it was, it was non-existent. There was probably three restaurants and I, I was fortunate enough to work at all three of them, but yeah, the restaurant thing sort of happened on mistake. I had no desire to study culinary arts. I had no desire to be in culinary arts as an avid skateboarder and got in trouble with the law a couple of times and, and my mom had enough. So I had to find a job and I, she's like, go get a job right now. And I literally skated five minutes down the street, found a restaurant, hired me as a dishwasher and went right back home and said, um, I got a job. So that's where, that's where it started. It was just a job. And then you know, once you get more involved and you see this, the energy and the, the flow of a restaurant, like that's something that I gravitated towards was just that energy and that hustle and bustle. And the, I called it controlled chaos. It's chaotic as hell, but it, it makes sense. So that's what drew me in. It was an accident for sure. Like I was pursuing the skateboarding career pretty hard. Which the money is tough there unless you're a skateboarding businessman. But at that time, I was just a young skateboarding punk. So that's how it started. And the rest got the washing dishes. In terms of skateboarding, like how close were you to going pro? I mean, this is probably what, mid 90s, early 90s, somewhere in there? 2002, 2003, but I was skateboarding up to that. It was all I did. I missed three quarters of my senior year. I don't know how I graduated. My guidance counselor felt bad for me, but I literally missed two full nine weeks and another half of a nine weeks. So I was just skateboarding all day and sort of honing in on that. I had the ability to have a couple of few sponsors with companies, but the track of going to pro, I still had a long road ahead of me. I was still young, but that sort of diminished. I got injured pretty bad in 2002. That sort of put a damper on the pursuit of trying to achieve that level of going pro. So I, that's when I sort of diverted the plan and, and you know started focusing more on the, the restaurant business. With the skateboarding too, like... Is it similar to kind of other individual sports like tennis or like even figure skating in the Olympics where you have this kind of narrow window when you're young to like grab on to either sponsorships or whatever to make that next step? You're not going to be like a 24 year old like that somebody's going to be like, hey, you know, you want to do this professionally kind of thing. Yeah, it's I mean, it's it's a process. You, you know, you got to start off by making videos of yourself and, and trying to submit them to like small little local skateboard shops. And they'll give you some flow, which is like, if you ride for our skate shop, we'll give you some free decks, a couple of shirts or whatever. But yeah, it's sort of like, it's, it's like anything you have to put yourself out there. You have to go to events, hang around the right people type of thing. It's, it's, and it's a really tough business to get into. Like you have to be really freaking good at skateboarding to, to ride. And, and this was back when skateboarding was super popular and I would hang out with 30, 40 kids on a given day downtown. And, you know, they were all equally as good. It, it's definitely a tough profession to get into. You got to pay your dues and work really hard. But once that injury happened, I knew sort of, I was screwed. Like I knew then that like, this probably is not going to be a long-term thing. So then, like you mentioned, you get your start kind of as a dishwasher and you work around kind of at that point, the three most popular kind of restaurants are around the Pittsburgh area. Peppercorns was one. That was my first kitchen job ever, yes. And is that where you started as a dishwasher? Yeah, that's the guy that got me started. And to be honest with you, if he wasn't the man he was, I don't know if I'd be in this profession, but he was a very good first mentor, very amazing first mentor. And I remember him specifically saying, I, I love you like a son, but don't do this for a living. Because it was a small little family run business in a small part of Pittsburgh, the outskirts of Pittsburgh. And I saw the passion, but I also saw the struggle of owning your own business and owning your own restaurant. I wasn't even thinking at the moment about that. I was just like, I just love the energy of a kitchen and I, I want to be involved in this. And after your dishwashing for a while and you kind of showed some interest in actual cooking and, and being on the line did they kind of graduate you into the line you know somebody missed a shift and you got to help out kind of thing 
Yeah, well, it was, it was, again, it was a tiny restaurant. It was his wife worked front of the house, his daughter worked front of the house, and his son was his other chef. So it was literally a family owned business. And I was the only other guy. He saw that I was interested in and said, Hey, do you want to come in before service and help me start prepping and, and working on some things? And which I did, did that for a while, fell in love with the restaurant business even more once I learned how to actually do things. Then had the ability to something happened with his son. His son was going away. I think his son was getting married. So he's like, I need you on the line. And I was like, okie dokie. I was like, let's do this. But yeah, it was fun. He was very patient with me. He was, he was a very good man, very patient. And at this time, I thought I knew everything too. So I'm sure he was frustrated as hell. After you're there for a little bit and you get some cooking experience, you wind up at Balm Vivant restaurant? Yeah, Balm Vivant. Yeah, it was a play on words. Like Bon Vivant, but it's Balm because it was a B-O-U-M. B-A-U-M, Baum Boulevard was the street that the, the restaurant was on. Yeah, that was my first experience of like Uber fine dining. It was a French, he's a Portuguese chef, but a French fine dining restaurant. Very different demographic, very different crowd, very different service. And I actually landed the gig as sous chef there after being at Peppercorns. When you're sous chef, is that the first time too? I'm assuming that you're kind of managing some other chefs, other cooks in the kitchen too? In a normal kitchen, yes. Again, this is in Pittsburgh when there wasn't a lot of restaurants, but it was another tiny kitchen. It was me, the executive chef, and one other cook. So essentially, I was a sous chef to one person. And to be frank, I wasn't even ready for that role. Like I had so much to learn, but I guess they thought I was ready. And I, I yeah, I took on that role. But looking back, it's funny to me to be labeled as a sous chef at that restaurant because there were literally three of us in the kitchen. I was excited, but looking back, it doesn't make any sense to have that title. And then after that, where do you head? Because eventually you wind up moving to Chicago. After Bon Vivant, I sort of didn't know where else to grow. I just sent my resumes to a bunch of a bunch of restaurants in Chicago and, and heard back from a pretty famous one and flew out there immediately to um, to stage. It was a whole different world. It was a whole everything I learned in Pittsburgh was out the window. So why Chicago versus you know you're in Pittsburgh, so you have Philly, New York's right there, equally as close. I don't know. I. I at this time, I knew somebody that visited Chicago and they said how great it was. And, and at this time, there were a lot of really cool restaurants that I, that I sort of knew about popping up in Chicago. And a, a big reason, too, was when I worked at Bon Vivant, I went to the James Beard House with them to New York. And I was like, another option is New York, but New York just gave me anxiety. Like that city was just too much for me at the time. Chicago is a little different. It's a little, little more chill than New York. But I'm glad I made that move. I mean, to this day, Chicago, I think, is the most beautiful city in the United States. Once you get to Chicago, you wind up working, I think, at uh, Moto. How did you wind up there? Is it just they responded to your resume that you applied to? or? Yeah, he responded back and said, when can you fly out here? I flew out literally like three days later. I flew out through like a terrible snowstorm in Chicago. I never experienced anything like that. I mean, we get snow in Pittsburgh, but this was brutal had no idea where I was going, literally had a backpack. It was a weekend stage, so I staged Friday and Saturday night. And then they offered me the job. They said, when can you come back? And to be honest, I didn't think I was going to get the job. And I was like, oh, I wasn't ready for that answer for that question. So I was like, I have to go back, get all my affairs together, you know, set up, get my apartment subletted. And I actually didn't move out there. They held that job for me for six months. I was able to go back six months later. To this day, I don't know why it took me so long to get out there. Something was going on, but me and my buddy, one of my best friends, drove up there and I started work the day after I moved there. What style of cuisine were they cooking there? Was it a French restaurant, a steakhouse? No, it was very cutting edge for 2005, 2006. It was considered molecular gastronomy. So very similar to what Wiley Dufresne was doing at WD50, what Ron Adrian was doing at Elbow Lee. He was an innovator for sure for what he was doing in the United States. Just a lot of science-driven food a lot of show in the food and a lot of theatrics in the food and a lot of shock and awe in the food. Yeah, it was a really cool experience. And it was just a little different because uh, there it wasn't a lot of cooking there. I know that sounds weird to say, but it was a lot of science shit, more of a science lab than it was, was it a kitchen. And I, I loved it. It was a great experience in my life, but I don't know how to explain it unless you were there. It was, it was a very magical moment. That memory of working there were always something I would cherish. After that, you go to Butter. Is that the next restaurant? You did your homework. Yeah, Butter. A really good friend of mine, Lee Woolen, was cook at Moto with me. And he left and took over his exec chef position at Butter. And once he found out I was leaving uh, Moto, he brought me on. Yeah, he's a good dude, man. He's doing great things. He has 
I don't know if you ever heard of like Boca Restaurant Group in Chicago. He's probably the exec chef partner of, I think, maybe six concepts right now that they're doing. He's doing really well in life. But that was a turning point in my career because that restaurant was hardcore cooking. And that was the first restaurant I was in Chicago that was hardcore cooking. Like you had to have your shit together at this place. It was, you were cooking. It wasn't science. It was, you know, you needed to know a lot. And I, and I learned a lot there. So I'm very thankful for him to give me that opportunity. When you say hardcore, are you talking just volume, the amount of stuff that you guys are putting out or organization too, just because how big the menu is? Yeah. Organization, perfection. You know, one dish has seven pot pickup, a lot going on. A lot going on. A lot of dish, a lot of components. The prep had to be perfect. The time execution had to be perfect. The way you sort of delegated your prep list for the day. If one thing was off, the night was fucked, essentially. So that was the first real kitchen I worked in when I was like, all right, this is what cooking's legitimately about. Like basting seven pieces of meat, four pieces of fish at the same time. It was it was pretty exciting. So how'd you wind up at Trencherman? Was that next? Trencherman, yeah. There were some restaurants. I worked at Schwa. After I left Butter, I, I worked helped open this restaurant with the, he was an old um, sous chef at Alinea. Great guy. The restaurant really didn't, business partners there were terrible. So the restaurant sort of failed. Then after that, I went to Schwa, spent a year at Schwa. Then after Schwa, I was the chef de cuisine at this cool little boutique hotel restaurant, then became the exec chef. After that is when I worked at Trencherman. I was, I was a big fan of Michael Sheeran. He was the chef de cuisine at Blackbird, which was one of my favorite restaurants in Chicago. Then he opened up Trencherman with his brother, found out they were hiring. He came in for dinner with his brother and I cooked for them and he offered me a, I was one of like four stew chefs to Trencherman on the opening team. Was that your first experience opening a restaurant, part of the opening team? Yes. So I was actually the exec chef at a hotel and whenever I wasn't working, I was there trying to help do stuff during the day, opening that place. So, you know, I sort of had my foot in the door before my time was up because I think I had to give like a month. I gave like a month notice when I was the, the exec chef. So that place was being built out but I also wanted to be a part of it. So anytime I had off, I was getting there. And it was it was a cool restaurant, volume, great food, very busy. Yeah, I mean, some of the other places you wind up working, I think like a powerhouse. I think you also wind up at a late, which might've been the hotel restaurant that you're you referencing, which was like your first executive chef gig. With all the places that you work in, in Chicago, with each kind of subsequent move, are you looking for a different style of restaurant to work at? Like you're looking for a different type of cuisine that they're cooking or fine dining versus casual environment? Or is it all about like building connections in that city environment like that? Yeah. At that time, all the restaurants were completely different styles. I think more so it was just working for the chef and trying to pick up on his style and learn from his style. And again, every kitchen was so different. The philosophy, the in and outs, the day to day were different, but I think I was more so looking for like, I want to work for this chef. I don't care what's going on. Like I want to learn from him and what he's doing. Did you have like an ultimate goal that you were working towards during your time in Chicago? Like I want to learn as much as I can so I can open my own restaurant or were you just trying to get to like a Michelin restaurant? I mean, I don't know if the Michelin guide was there. Yeah, it was. Yeah. My goal at the end of the day was I definitely want to do my own thing one day, but I also knew I had a lot to learn. So that was why it's very important for me to try to get, get a hold and try to get my foot in the door at these restaurants to work for these chefs. Cause that's how you learn at the end of the day. I mean, and I had the, the ability to work for um, this guy named Jake Bicklehop. It was a underground dining club that him and I did alone. He had a Netflix series called 42 Grams on Netflix that sort of told you a little bit about that backstory. That was the turning point in my career where I was like, I want to do my own thing after this. I don't want to work for anybody else after this. That underground dining club was called Sue Rising. Him and his wife, who was eventual ex-wife Alexa there, they kind of did the whole thing out of their apartment for a while, then opened a restaurant called 42 Grams. We actually went to that restaurant like a week before it closed. We actually ate there. So normally I have like menus behind. Any tasting restaurant that gives us the menu, we usually get it framed. I don't have it up just because we're in a temporary apartment, but normally I could point it to you. How did you kind of wind up working with him and, and with them in that kind of setting? Because that seems like a odd thing to kind of take a leap to. Yeah, I could write a fucking book on that that year of my life. I really could. It was the most insane, intense, stressful, gratifying situation. So I honestly got, I think I was online just looking at pictures and I found some pictures of what this guy was doing and I never heard of him. And I emailed him and I said, listen, man, I said, I think what you're doing is fucking amazing. Can I be a part of it? 
And he shut me down at first because I think he, he told me later on that he thought I was somebody else that was like hounding him for a job and he just wanted nothing to do with me. And I finally kept reaching out to him. I said, just let me stage with you. And I, and I staged and I literally walk into this guy's apartment and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? And met him and saw how he operated. And I was like, I want to work for you. I said, I really don't care what I make. I said, I just want to be a part of this. I just never seen passion like that from a person. Were you in the documentary at all? Yeah, I was in it for a little bit. Yeah. Did you ever work in the restaurant when it became 42 grams at all? I didn't. The initial goal was I was supposed to be the chef de cuisine for him at 42 grams. And then my wife got pregnant and then we decided to leave Chicago. Stu Rising. I worked the last service at Stu Rising and he was shutting it down and the focus on 42 grams. And I was supposed to help him be a part of that, but I moved. That was very bittersweet because I wanted to be a part of that, but I also knew that I didn't want to raise a kid in Chicago. So uh, we moved. Where'd you guys go after? Charlotte. Why Charlotte? Good question. We just have family all along the Eastern Seaboard. We have family in Pittsburgh. My dad's in Atlanta. Uh, my sister's in Charlotte. Her dad's in Florida. So it just was it mostly because my sister lived here and her best friend lived here from moved here from Florida. So it was just a good hub for us to be closer to sort of everybody. So yeah, it was definitely a family situation that, that made us decide to move to Charlotte. At that point, were you eyeing up like open in your own restaurant too? Like that was the next thing when you moved to Charlotte? It was. And yes, me and my me and my business partner were friends up to that. And it's something that we always talked about. And he was considering moving back to Charlotte from Arizona. It took a while because I was we had a new baby. I was a stay home dad for a couple of years. And it, me, him and I were always talking about what we wanted to do. And once he moved back, that's when him and I sort of hit the streets and, and we're like, we're going to do this. And um tried to find a location and go from there. It was a very long process from me moving from Chicago, almost four or five years until we opened something. Your business partner is Jason Whiteside. How did you guys kind of first meet? I know you guys met in Chicago originally, but do you guys work together or did you just kind of meet casually? No, they all went to school with my wife. So they came up to visit her like for like a weekend. And I was working at Schwa at the time. So I, I didn't, I was getting done at like three in the morning. So I didn't really get to spend any time with him, but I came home one night at three in the morning and they were just all lit to shit. So I was like, started partying with them and became friends from there. When you're a stay at home dad, but you still want to open your own restaurant, how challenging is that? How difficult is that? Cause I mean, there's gotta be times where you feel like you're not even like working towards that goal, right? You're like, is this going to happen? Am I done cooking? Like I wasn't ready to say being done cooking wasn't even on my mind. It was just a matter of when. And to be honest, my focus at the time was being a stay home dad. I just wanted that time with my son. Then we had a second kid. So I was a stay home dad to my son and my daughter. And then finally, I was like, it's time. Like I need if I don't get it going now, I'm going to get probably not get it going. Was the idea was it really put together at a wedding that both you and Jason were at? It was a drunk conversation. Yes. I mean, this is probably the second time we met. And Jason was just really interested in the restaurant business. So I think we were fucking around and I was like, let's open a restaurant. And he's like, okay. And then many conversations came after that. And again, like I said, he finally moved back here. Then we, we pulled the trigger on it and we both had no idea what we were fucking doing. Wasn't it originally supposed to be like a gastro pub? It was supposed to be more a very upscale restaurant with TVs. And yeah, there's a lot going on. A lot of mixed ideas between him and I. And I think eventually once he saw it, sort of where I was at, and the direction I wanted the restaurant to go, he was he was pretty excited about it. And I just told him, I said, if we open a second concept, that can be more your style. That was our agreement. And what made you kind of ultimately settle on the concept for Bardo? Bardo is a mesh up between sort of schwa and 42 grams, just very minimal. We still did really good refined food. We started on a la carte, but my initial goal was to always sort of go into a tasting menu. Um, I was honestly deathly afraid to open a tasting menu in 2018 in Charlotte at the time. I wasn't known in the city. It was, it, to me, I, I thought it was a really big risk. We built up the clientele and sort of the, the rapport that, you know, him and I said after the pandemic, let's turn this into a strictly tasting menu restaurant. You guys kind of open May 2018. The location is the like Gold District South End. Was that just a space that you guys found that you felt would work? Yeah, it, we looked at a lot of spaces. It's like the style down here. It was an older, you know, an older building in the city. Fitted what we wanted to do. A lot of new things were popping up in Charlotte. And we didn't want that new cookie cutter type of building. So yeah, and it's it's very reminiscent of. Again, I was in love with the dynamic of Schwa and the, the way that restaurant was. It was literally a 
rectangle dining room with an open kitchen. That was it. You know, I, I give credit to Schwa because that's sort of what I wanted Bardot to, to resemble. Just a simple open kitchen restaurant. We didn't spend a lot on decor. We kept it very minimal. We just wanted the food, the food to do the talking. Were you really sourcing and handpicking all the ingredients yourself when you guys first opened? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like, what do you mean by that? Like foraging? Well, I mean, if there was any foraging, but also just, I mean, like you were doing everything, right? Like not really delegating, but like you were fully on like everything kind of passed through you. Yes, I was doing my best to find the best of everything. And I just wanted, to, I wanted that mentality going in is I want to have the best of everything because I want these, I want the people in Charlotte to know that I know how to cook because I didn't, I didn't have a name for me. Yeah, you know what I mean? They didn't know who I was. So I had to, I had to prove to them that I knew what I was doing and that they could come into Bordeaux and trust me. But yeah, it was, it was me sort of doing everything nine in the morning until about two in the morning, five nights a week, um, had an amazing team. But yeah, I, I definitely, I think I put a lot of effort in, in seeking the best products that we can get. For sure. Might have been a little, not as cost efficient. Now I think about it, I spent, spent a lot of money on some really good stuff. But Charlotte, at that time when you guys opened, is there anything similar to what you guys were doing or were you guys super unique to, because you referenced like Tasty Menu and were there even a whole lot of Tasty Menu restaurants in Charlotte at that time? No, there was none. I don't like to say that, but I mean, a lot of people, and I find it very flattering said that Bordeaux was sort of a gateway. But at this time, there was a lot of great chefs in Charlotte. But I, I think our restaurant was unique in what we were doing 100%. I think it was different, um, different to the city, different style of food. Thought process was different and sort of how we, we approach things and our, you know, my style and how I wanted the food to go out and the food to look and the dynamic of the kitchen. You have a Conroe in the kitchen. What is special or different with that comparing it to all the other grills that you know, you could have had installed or could be used in like a live fire restaurant these days. It's just an amazing cooking vessel. It's, it gets so hot. It gets the perfect sear, what you need to do on a piece of meat. It's smokeless. It just has, it has a lot of, a, a lot of qualities to what a grill would have or a gas grill puts a flavor on whatever you're cooking that it's sort of hard to describe. It's the, that Japanese, the bitchy tongue cool, which is just next level. So yeah, I, it was more so just a, a a great technique for me that I wanted to have in the kitchen. I think after you guys are open a little bit, COVID unfortunately happens. How did you kind of navigate those challenges? Cause I mean, you know, you're a tasty menu restaurant. You don't have a to go program at that point. COVID happens. You're in like the process of opening another restaurant already when that happens too. Those are tough times. It was really tough. Um, we were just starting to gain momentum at Bardo. And, and sort of be consistent and, and be in a good spot then and, and that shit happened and we had to like completely transition and say how the hell are we going to stay alive through this and, and do stuff to make revenue you know so we were doing cocktail kits sold a lot of cocktail kits um we'd run a couple like couple sandwich specials um super fast casual food we didn't really try to we didn't want to try to do fine dining to go food or elevated to go food so um we tried to make the best couple sandwiches we could make, do the cocktail kits, and, and stay alive, stay alive in that manner. Um, but it was just, it was really tough because, like I said, we were gaining momentum. And then I'll never forget. It was like a Saturday, and I was like, "Man, our reservations just cut in half for some." Then the following Monday, restaurants we had to shut down. So yeah, that was tough. And uh, yeah, like you said, on top of that, we were in the middle of building Alvana, so we had to put a hold on that for a little bit. It wasn't fun. Fun is not a word I'd use to describe that situation. <laughs> We tried our best to uh, make whatever we could, though. You know, you and Jason wind up opening Vana in like August of 2020. Looking back on that now from everything that you know, almost two years later after opening, because you guys are coming up on your two-year anniversary in a couple months for that. Does that seem insane at all to you? It was a busy time. Fortunately, you know, my business partner busts his ass. So he was he was spending a lot of time at Vana getting that place getting it ready for opening when doing takeout stuff at Bordeaux. But the crazy thing is we were able to reopen and go to half capacity. Like the people were so ready and Vana was just, we were busy. That's, that's something that I didn't really expect to see right off the gate um, from opening Vana. It was a good feeling. It was, it was just a good feeling to be back in a busy kitchen and, and the to-go shit sort of being thrown aside. Did you guys ever like have an opportunity to like 
back out of the lease or anything for that space when COVID happened? Because I mean, I think I read something like you guys were about like half a million all in. Luckily, our landlord was very generous and understanding of the situation. And, and of course, me and Jason weren't going to quit. We weren't going to give up. We sort of had a vision and we were going to stick with it. It was scary. It was a uh, but if, like I said, if the landlord wasn't pushing and, and very excited for us to be in that space, it might have ended differently. But he was very lenient and understanding of the situation. So that, I think that helped give us the opportunity to, to build it out properly. How different is Vana from Bardo? Very different. Uh, two very different concepts. So Bardo, you know, we focus on sort of refinement. And when I say attention to detail, everything is very precise in plating and everything has to sort of be visually and you know, it's it's and then fun is more fast paced my chef de cuisine there's amazing it's just it's a very rustic natural menu large cuts of meats whole fish um, lots of vegetables we, a lot of lo- we use mostly local farms for all of our uh, vegetables that we're doing there and again it's no gas so everything's cooked on live fire so yeah i, I would say it's pretty different than than what we're doing at porto which is a lot of sous vide cooking and uh and going into cooking strictly on fire just a lot more I don't know how to classify it, and I don't like to use the word rustic, but it is a it's more rustic cooking. Simple but delicious. And it's a small kitchen too, right? Like only four chefs, cooks in there at a time kind of thing? So there's one on Garmage, one on the wood-burning oven, one on the hearth, and my chef on the pass. And that's sort of the same philosophy we have at Bordeaux. We got two chefs at the pass and usually three cooks at Bordeaux. Is that set up by kind of design where it's you kind of want everybody to have their hands in almost every little aspect, but still have some division or is it just restrictions of the space? Um, I think it's more so the way that the, I set the kitchens up. It's again, it's an open kitchen. So it has to be methodic in the way that the kitchen's designed. But I like to have sort of people focusing on one station and I try to avoid people running around crisscrossing in an open kitchen, uh, avoiding chaos and, and confusion. And like, again, I think a, a four man team for Vana you have a very restricted space that you can work in. So once you're there by yourself, you figure out and, and, and how it makes sense and how it's going to benefit. If you have too many people there, it's just going to be confusing. So I think it's more beneficial with the way we have it opposed to trying to squeeze a couple more cooks in there. How challenging is the food scene in Charlotte? Because I mean, it, it seems to be kind of on the upswing, a lot of different openings, some national recognition too, as well for a handful of places too. So is that kind of a, a rising tide lifts all boats or or is there kind of different segments within the food scene in, in Charlotte? Kind of people click together? Or? Yeah, very, very strong chef community in Charlotte. Everyone sticks together, does everything they can to support each other and help each other out. The food scene in Charlotte right now is amazing. Some amazing chefs, a lot of different concepts. And, and you know, the biggest, most important thing is that people in Charlotte are excited to try new things and experience new things and get out of the sort of the, the show of whatever mindset people had about food five, six years ago in Charlotte. Got a lot of people moving here from or different parts of the, the United States. So there's a, there's a revolving door to keep doing great things in the city, I think. And there's a lot of young kids that are going to keep pushing that, which is, which is exciting. Is there any like food or, you know, ingredient or something that just doesn't seem to stick in the, the Charlotte food scene, whether it's for some reason, seafood or lamb or something that people just don't seem to kind of it's, it's hard. You have hit or misses. You have ups and downs with things that we put on the menu. Um, like at Vana, I mean, we saw a lot of a lot of steaks. So meat sells, our whole fish sells. Uh, we do whole octopus, which sells. At Bordeaux is when we sort of get a little more, we like to, to mess with different ingredients. Um, like we're working on a jellyfish pad thai dish right now on our tasting menu at, at Bordeaux. That's going to be super cool. I'd say one of the most challenging things that we've ever had to deal with at Bordeaux was sweetbreads. And I absolutely love sweetbreads. They're hit or miss. They're hit or miss, which is really weird because when we had a la carte menu, people would order the hell out of sweetbreads. But once I put them on the tasting menu, you know, because at Bardot, they don't, you don't know what you're eating. Like you get your menu when you're done with your meal. We ask you restrictions, allergies, then, you know, it's just us, us cooking for you. So once we put the sweetbreads on the tasting menu, we got a lot of people that, that would not touch them. The sweetbreads is a challenge. It's one of my favorite ingredients. So people try everything at Bardot. It's exciting. We can do cook whatever we want. Are you still a uh, Miller High Life and frozen pizza guy? Pizza rolls. Yeah, that's my jam. I, I like simple beer. Mexican, I like cervezas and, and High Life and PBR in a bottle. It's just easy to drink. I'm not too refined with the IPA situation. It's, it gives me cotton mouth and does nothing for me. Yeah, I'm not a big IPA guy. You're mostly uh, sour beers if I'm going beer. 
Yeah, I like it sour. I just don't understand like how on a hundred degree day drinking like a triple IPA. It's like in spoonful of dandelion, those dandelion flowers. I just get cotton mouth so bad. I don't, I don't get it. Which I want to like them because I think a lot of the beer business now is like the chef business. Like the, the stuff they're doing is so creative and what they're putting into beers, but I just can't tolerate them. So I support Miller High Life. You never went to culinary school. Is that something that when you look back on your career, you regret it all? Or do you think, you know, that all the hands-on experience that you got was way more beneficial than anything you would have picked up in culinary school? I regret not so much the cooking part, but just the ins and outs of the business, the, the business classes and, and, and what goes into operating a business and having a complete understanding on that is something that I wish I would have went to school for. Yeah. You'd be more interested in basically going to school like a business program versus like an actual culinary school, right? Yeah. Cause when I, again, I did go to culinary school for two months. I went to a, an apprentice or a, it was a community college apprenticeship program. So I'd have classes two days a week and I had to be in the restaurant the rest. But halfway through that, I was like, why am, there's no point in me being here, which I regret again, because that was just the culinary classes. And once you moved up, you're going to start hitting the business classes and, and marketing and, and everything you need to sort of know the ins and outs of operating a business. And I, I, I pulled the plug on it before I got to that point. So I, I do regret that. Yeah. So if someone asked you, someone in one of your kitchens was like, Hey, I'm thinking about going to culinary school, you know, eventually open a restaurant of my own one day. What would you tell them? I would tell them to think about it. It's very expensive. I tell all of them, you know, and I had, I've had two of my cooks from Bordeaux take my opinion. And I, I tell them to move to Chicago and New York or San Francisco. If that's what you want to do. I would move. I just had someone leave and move to Chicago. Now he's working at a two Michelin star restaurant. So that's my thought process on learning. I think you need to work under amazing chefs instead of an instructor trying to teach you, but that's just my outlook on life. Since you've been in the Charlotte restaurant industry, how has it changed? What do you think still needs to change? Where do you think it's headed? When we opened Bardo, there was very select few restaurants. Once Bardo, once the pandemic, after the pandemic, a lot more restaurants started opening and then all these sort of great chefs started coming out of the woodwork. Again, I think this, the food scene's great. I just wish Charlotte was looked at as a food city sort of put on the map because there are some amazing chefs doing some great things here. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people look at Charlotte sometimes and they're like, Oh, not really much going on there. They have their eyes on the big cities that, you know, there's some people here doing some, some great things that I think are changing that. So I'm excited to see that the food scene alone in the past five years here is night and day, just like Pittsburgh. Did you ever consider going back to Pittsburgh to open a restaurant at all? Or are you Charlotte through and through now? You know, I got a couple leases here, so we're, <laughs> so we're, we're going to be here a while. But I got approached on, actually, Tony, the guy that owned Bon Vivant, approached me on. He was trying to sell his little bistro. My best friend, who was my, I worked with at Bon Vivant, was thinking about buying it and wanted to know if I wanted to be a part of it with him. And yeah, no, just no interest right now. Just want to focus on what me and Jace are doing at the moment. What's next for you professionally? You know, what's on the horizon for you? So me and Jason are opening another Vana. It's in the works right now in Lake Norman. and. Um, you know, the main focus, honestly, is just keep, keep breaking ground at Bordeaux, but also, you know, keep building our brand, our Vana brand that, that we're trying to, um, trying to get going. So that other location, is that outside the city or where is that geographically? It's about 30 minutes uh, outside the city. Uh, it's called Cornelius, it's a Lake Norman area. So that's like a whole different group of people who probably don't make it to Charlotte too much with traffic and everything. Different digra. It's a, I think it's a good thing for it us to be out there like the gives people the opportunity to come there that would never come down to south end and that that area out there is just growing like crazy again i always say my business partner is always he has a, a knack for finding spaces locations like demographic research and i, and I think this location is going to be really good for us do you think that's something more restaurants will kind of look towards as covid has kind of taught anybody anything i think if you have a proven concept it's kind of continue to flush that out instead of trying something new. I think people are more cautious of, of trying new things versus in terms of opening businesses more so than people's eating habits. Do you think more people that have foundationally solid restaurants, we should open another location of that proven concept versus something that's experimental? I think that'll be kind of a thing we see for the next few years. I think a lot of chefs are definitely trying to build their brand and, and yeah, if you have a great concept and it's working, why not 
try to replicate it. If it's like a, a completely different concept, but I think if you know what you're doing and you, and you built your name, I think the people will follow that concept. Um, we're just, we're just, you know, him and I are really excited about Vana and the style of restaurant. And, and, you know, we think it would be good in different locations. This next question comes from previous guests on the podcast, Chef Jamie Simpson, who's the executive chef up at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. He left behind a question for you. What vegetable did you grow up hating, but have now come to love? Yeah, no, I like that question. So uh, unfortunately, I ate a lot of canned vegetables growing up. I don't remember any fresh vegetables, a lot of fruit, but I would say rutabaga. Yeah. Cause my mom used to put those in stew and I can hated them and I love them now. I love, you know, like parsnips, parsley root, rutabagas is like, I just love, I love root vegetables now. You know, I have my favorite vegetables now that I've sort of been introduced being a chef that I never ate as a kid, but yeah, I would go with the rutabaga. What's a question you want to leave behind for the next guest? I think a fun one is when you were a kid, what is one food that you say you would never eat that you're eating right now? And the reason why I say that is because how I grew up, my how I grew up in, in Pittsburgh, and now I looked at my two favorite things to eat are anchovies and caviar. Those are just two things that I would never in a million years think about. I would be putting in my mouth growing up. And in, in this business, your your palate's changed so much. What is something that you eat now that you would have never thought in a million years you would be eating? I'm always intrigued by that because I'm like, the things I eat now, how did I get to that point of these being my favorite things to eat? Yeah. So much of it, I think too, is going back to rutabaga for you. You know, it's in stews and, and you didn't like it. And you had that first experience and that's always what you associate that with here in, in Columbus. Like there's people that are like, I don't like seafood. And so you're like, oh, well, like clams or mussels or, or what? And they're like, I don't like any of it. And you're like, what? Like, you don't like any of it. And it's like, oh, because like the first time you had fish, like it wasn't fried all the way or something like that. And like you ate raw fish and now you're just like, no, I don't want it anymore. You know? So I think a lot of it is your first experience, your first encounter with some of that stuff as a kid really shapes what you're going to eat for the next, you know, if you're going to even be willing to try that again for probably like next 20 years until you're in your mid twenties and you're like, well, let me, let me try that again. I haven't had that. And everybody else around me seems to like it. So like, what am I missing? Yeah. I think it's like childhood trauma, but it's childhood trauma with food. Like for instance, I can't eat cooked fish. I, it has to be raw. I love anything from the ocean that's raw. And I think it's because growing up, nobody knew how to cook seafood properly in my family. Not talking shit on anyone. I love them all, but it tainted me from liking cooked fish. So I, I appreciate the value of a, of raw seafood. One of my favorite things to eat is, is anything that I can get my hands on that eating raw from the ocean is, is my, my jam. So next question comes from one of our listeners. How different is it cooking in the South to Charlotte versus cooking in the Midwest, like either Pittsburgh or Chicago? My style has really never changed. I'd say the most challenging thing is ingredient sourcing. You can find different things in the Midwest that you can't find in Charlotte. You can find different things in the South and than in Charlotte. So I, I mean, I, I've held always pretty true to my style of, of cooking that I never sort of had to transform it depending on what part of the United States I was in. It's just more so locating ingredients, getting getting the ingredients that you want to get can be different in different parts. You know what I mean? Is there anything that you can't get in Charlotte where you're at now versus you could back in the day in Chicago or? Sometimes great seafood can be a little more challenging to get at times. And I don't, I don't know, you know, big city might have more of a import of that than, than a smaller city, but yeah, it's just different things, different, different purveyors. There might be purveyors in Chicago that are not in the Midwest that have things that you want to carry and things like that, but nothing, any, anything really specific, but I, you know, it's just, it can be challenging at times to sort of locate something that might be easier to get in, in the Midwest. So this last set of questions we asked everybody who comes on the podcast. So a nice compare and contrast across all the episodes. Who is the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far, would you say, looking back on it? Definitely Jake Bicklehub from uh, Sue Rising, 100%. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? My spoons. Got to have plating spoons. Restaurant you'd recommend that isn't your own. So a scenario I usually give, person stuck at the airport, stuck overnight, they're going to go get something to eat. They reach out to you. You guys aren't open. You point them in this direction. Definitely say Kindred. Uh, Kindred and Davidson and... Uh, machete in greensboro so if you're at the airport that might be a little haul but it's worth it 
bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant. So place you haven't traveled to, haven't visited that you, you want to get to one day. And then also a restaurant you haven't eaten at yet, but you definitely want to get to. And I've always wanted to go to Portugal. I would love to go to Portugal just because I, one of my chefs from Portugal and he told me magical stories about it. Yeah. I'd like to go eat seafood in Portugal and restaurant wise. I know this sounds cliche, but I, I would love to eat at Noma. I'd love to experience that. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? I got a lot. What can I say on the air? You can say anything. I mean, the craziest story I think that we've had so far was we had a woman pleasuring herself with a wine cork in the middle of a restaurant. And then uh, we also had a SWAT team bust into a restaurant because a guy had a gun and he wound up being an off-duty like undercover cop or something like that. Well, to piggyback on that, one of the craziest shits I've ever seen was a SWAT team come in and take down our dishwasher. He had a felony. That was interesting. I think one of the craziest things was we had um, this lunatic come in and eat at Bardo and decided to paint the bathroom walls with her bathroom situation. Lunatic. I don't know if I want anybody knowing that, but that shit was just bizarre. Yeah, this lady was eating there. Then I went out back to confront her and she was hiding inside like four tires that were stacked up next to the dumpster. I don't know what was going on there, but that was very, very weird. She made a mess in our bathroom. That's for sure. Yeah, a couple fights. Uh, the corkscrew one, I mean, I can't even compare to that. The cork. How is that even possible? Food or drink guilty pleasure. Aside from uh, pizza rolls and, and Miller High Life, is there anything else that, uh, you know, is terrible for you, but you just can't stay away, can't help yourself? It's not a guilty pleasure. I mean, it's not a, I don't think it's terrible for you, but I love canned anchovies. But I also, I mean, I tend to eat a lot of, trying to eat healthier now than I used to. But I, you know, I think it. A steak and shake burger every once in a while, but I always feel like shit afterwards eating one. So that might be a guilty pleasure. How are you with like tinned fish? Like, are you big into that or? No, not so much. I mean, I've tried it all. Like uh, even the sardines, the bigger sardines, I'm not a fan of. It's just something about anchovies. Anchovies, my, my, I like tuna. I like canned tuna. Love canned tuna, but. Favorite Instagram account you follow? I'm going to have to look that up. It's a chef in, I can't even pronounce it. It's some chef in Germany. Yeah, I follow a lot of a lot of chefs, and I'm also not too savvy on Instagram, so I, I can't I can't give you a specific Instagram follow right now. Favorite dish, favorite thing you ever cooked, created. Looking back on your career, you can kind of point to this dish as almost like your aha moment. Like you knew you could be a professional chef, do this, and open your own restaurant. You can kind of point to this dish as like it all coming together. I think I that train of thought came like more so with with my technique that I thought I was able to do that. But I would say like an aha dish was um, an opening dish at Bardo we did. It was sous vide, sous vide strip loin, just like a perfect cube of strip that we did on the, the Conroe grill. Basically it was soy, tamari, sous vide, perfect rare. And we did like, it was called spice soy. But it, was, it was essentially like a Bordelais sauce, but it was lemongrass, ginger, 30 other components. And then we had a, we did a kimchi, uh, Carolina gold rice porridge. And the dish was just so simple, but everything on it was perfect. It was just, it was, to me, I thought it was a perfect dish. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan, but not everybody is. If you were, was there a moment episode scene about him that stands out to you the most? If you weren't, is there another culinary personality, somebody that was on TV, either on, you know, PBS back in the day or Emerald or, or somebody that you kind of gravitated towards during your career when you were coming up? Um, I didn't really watch. I watched Great Chefs. I don't know if you remember that show. It's like great, great chefs. It was called Great Chefs. I was really big into Marco Pierre White, and when Marco Pierre White was doing his his show, and I also like Boiling Points, like old Gordon Ramsay shit. Uh, I'm a big fan of Marco Pierre White and old school Gordon Ramsay. Like those two dudes are the real deal. Where can people find you? Social media, website, plug everything. I am on Instagram. It's at, at Chef Michael Knoll. Not on Facebook. I'm against Facebook, but our websites are. BonaRestaurant.com and BardoRestaurant.com. That's our situation we have going right now. Or you can find it at BardoRestaurant.com is our Instagram. Or at BardoRestaurant is our Instagram handle. And at Vana Restaurant. We had a fantastic meal at Bardo. Definitely be in again wherever you know we come back down to, to Charlotte. My wife has family in the area. So you know it's a place that I think you know we've been to a couple times now. And and each time it gets better and better. You know, I think the first time I visited Charlotte, I was kind of like, eh. Everybody always kind of compared it to Columbus here. And they're like, yeah, it's a cleaner Columbus, was what my one friend always said. And uh, first time I didn't really kind of get it, but 
the past, you know, couple of times that we visited, it's definitely grown on me and it's definitely a cool city with a up and coming kind of cool restaurant scene too. I think you guys are ahead of us uh, here in Columbus in terms of kind of pushing the boundaries and, and growing and, and recognition and stuff. But it's kind of like when you compare the two, I think it's, it's definitely the path that Columbus as a food city would probably want to follow. There's going to be one chef one day that's going to push those boundaries in Columbus. There's going to be an innovator somewhere. It's going to turn in like even like I said, Pittsburgh. I don't I don't know what the hell. When I was in Pittsburgh, it was I love the city, but the food scene wasn't there. And young kids are doing good things. Pittsburgh's a great place to go eat. For sure, yeah, we've been to uh, been to Pittsburgh once, but uh, you know, definitely got to make it back since it's been a few years, and the food scene, I'm sure, has changed drastically too. So, you know, I can't recommend Bardo enough to anybody who's headed to Charlotte. Didn't get a chance to check out Vana, but um, that'll be on our short list, I'm sure, for the next visit. Appreciate you taking the time and, and stay in touch. And if there's anything you ever need from us, you know, feel free to reach out. We try and support everybody as much as we can, as much as possible. And otherwise, hopefully, we'll uh, see you within like the next uh, year or so. Next time you come to the city, let me know and I'll make sure I'm there to greet you because I'd like to meet you. Sure. Definitely hit you up. Yeah. Thanks again for coming on and stay in touch. Need anything from us, let us know. Otherwise, we'll talk soon. Awesome, Ray. I appreciate it. Thanks, bud. Big thanks again to Chef Michael Knoll for coming on the podcast, taking some time out of one of his mornings to chat about his career and Bardo, where everything's headed, Charlotte, the food scene, all that stuff. So hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. Again, you can follow him on Instagram at Chef Michael Knoll, N-O-L-L for the last name there, all one word. Also at Bardo Restaurant and at Vana Restaurant too as well, V-A-N-A. Follow us on Instagram too as well at Spoon Mob. Make sure to check out the website, SpoonMob.com. And then subscribe, follow the podcast on your preferred podcast app. Really appreciate everybody listening. First time kind of visiting Charlotte, kind of a mixed bag and have visited since and really enjoyed it. So um, it's definitely on the short list of, of places for us. Uh, maybe one day, you know, live there for a little while. I'm not sure. See what happens down the road. Uh, life's been chaos for the past four months. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I really appreciate everybody listening. Uh, everybody who's come on the podcast, helping support us too as well. Spending an hour and a half, two hours, almost upward of three hours sometimes chatting about their career and food and hospitality and wine. It's not lost on us. You know, a lot of these people are busy. A lot of them are running their own businesses and every minute of their day matters and counts that they should be doing something towards that. So when they take time out to to do this and do, you know, what people call press and stuff like that, it's really cool that, you know, they're willing to, to give us some of their time. So we want to support them as much as we can. And that's why you'll see in our stories, we try and repost as much as we can about different menu updates or special dinners that they're doing or, you know, opening new concepts, whatever it is, anything that, you know, could be something new that they're kind of putting out there. You know, we want to make sure that we highlight as much as we can in case people aren't following both accounts or miss the Instagram posts because the algorithm has changed and, you know, all somebody sees is videos and they log off the app before they see stuff that they want to see or, or whatever. So if you find yourself tagged in a podcast post, uh, that's a good thing. That means you came up organically somewhere in the conversation. And we just wanted to make sure that we gave you a shout out um, and that you knew that you were kind of name dropped somewhere in that episode. It's always good things. So don't freak out uh, if you find yourself tagged in the comments or something like that. Uh, it's a good thing. So appreciate everybody listening. Continue to help spread the word. If you're new, welcome. If you've been here since the beginning or for a while, appreciate you staying with us. More cool episodes and cool conversations on the way. Super excited about everything that's to come. We'll talk to you guys next week.